Okay. All right. Wahoo. Okay. So we have a lot to talk about. So I'm going to dive right in with Pastor Mark's permission. Um, the the title of this Bible journey is the Day of Atonement of Affliction or of Angel Emulation. And inevitably, where we need to start is where we start reading about the Day of Atonement in the Bible. The truth of the matter is, there is one cursory allusion to it before this passage, but the principal main first presentation of the Day of Atonement is in Leviticus chapter 16. Now, inevitably, what I, I always need to share at the outset, and, and you folks all know this very well, and I know this is a message that Pastor Mark has been sharing for many years, that is, while the feasts of the Lord that are presented in the Torah are obligations for Israel, any Bible believer sees in every word of God in the Bible a message to him or her. So that's our premise. These are biblical holy days. Yes, they are Jewish holidays, but they're also biblical holy days in the broadest sense of having a message for everyone who believes in the Bible. Now, the truth of the matter is that when we read Leviticus chapter 16, most of Leviticus chapter 16, on any direct level, to what extent does it have a message to us today? Mm, not really. To what extent did it ever have a message to us? Well, the truth of the matter is that most of Leviticus chapter 16 is addressed to one particular person, yeah. the high priest in the Holy Temple. Well, we don't have a high priest today, and we don't have a Holy Temple. But the end of Leviticus chapter 16 broadens the canvas considerably, and it gives us a universal message of what the identity of this day is. So in chapter 16, we're, we're reading from verse 29, and it shall be a statute forever unto you in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your lives and shall do no manner of work, the homeborn or the proselyte that sojourns among you. Well, you know, the first part of this referring to the seventh month, hey, we talked about that last week, so we're not going to address that now. Um, as for this expression, you shall afflict your lives. There are many translations that will render that as you shall afflict your souls. The Hebrew word, nafshotechem, from nefesh, mm. isn't referring to the soul in any rarefied or transcendent sense. Nefesh really means more the life force. So to that extent, then, what you're afflicting is your life. And how are you afflicting your life? Well, of course, we know, and this is an unbroken tradition that goes back to when God gave us the Torah at Sinai, that we fast. It's interesting, though. The Bible doesn't say fast. It says afflict your lives. You might be wondering, well, maybe there's no word in biblical Hebrew for fasting. Ah, but there is. It's a different word. And we'll be discussing it shortly. So I'll leave it kind of dangling here right now as a cliffhanger. But the imperative includes two fundamental aspects of the way we observe this day. You afflict your lives and you do no manner of work. And what's the goal? This is, of course, the third central motif. For on this day shall atonement be made for you to purify you from all of your sins. You shall be purified before the Lord. Now, there, there is one critically important word here that we've got to elucidate, but I'm going to push that off a couple of minutes because it requires a separate discussion. That is, uh, this part about atonement, well, I have to admit, I don't exactly know what atonement means in English. But 
moreover, I also don't care. The reason <laughs> I don't care is because the Bible doesn't use the word atonement either. Because the Bible wasn't written in English. The Bible uses the word yechaper, and we're going to have to figure out what yechaper means. And whether atonement is the right translation or not is going to be an accessory question, but we need to understand what the identity of this day is. But it is a day that unequivocally is intended to purify you from all of your sins. You shall be purified before the Lord. What a colossal message. The day of forgiveness. It is can, a can Sabbath a quick of question. solemn rest. Sorry? Can I ask just a real quick question? Sure, please. Hey, this, this is a well, be, because because there's a big difference in sin in the Torah. Is this I'm from intention? Is this from intentional or unintentional sins at this time, or both? Excellent, excellent question. So the question, the truth of the matter is that the term that is used in the Hebrew is chatotechem, which means unintentional sin. That is the way I like to render chet in simple English is goofing or maybe more precisely and maybe more rigorously missing the mark you know exactly in the story in the story of the the terrible debacle that takes place at the end of the book of judges you know pertaining to the war of israel against the benjaminites oh well, yeah so what did the Benjamins have, have going for them? They were archers. Right. And they were able to shoot an arrow in right. the Hebrew, velo yachati. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that the arrow wouldn't sin. It means the arrow wouldn't miss the mark. Right, so exactly. Ted is goofing in the sense of missing the mark. And even with respect to those, those mess ups, you know, I'll, I can't help but note here another context in which we also encounter the same word for sin. And it is undoubtedly of tremendous relevance in our considering just why there is this need for being purified from sin. It is precisely what we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. For there is no man righteous... In all of the earth, who can do good and not sin. Same word, yecheta, same root of sin, unintentional wrongdoing. And, uh, you know, I always like to note, this is a little bit of a, an elaboration on what it, it admittedly is a, a parenthetical note that Pastor Mark introduced, but I think it's important to, to, to stress this, that um, that verse in Ecclesiastes, you know, gives you two surefire ways of avoiding ever sinning. I repeat the verse. There is no man righteous in all the earth who can do good and not sin. So how can you be guaranteed to ever avoid ever sin? Number one, you could avoid ever being on earth. Exactly. The verse says, there's no man righteous in all the earth. Number two, don't do any good. Because the verse says, there's no man righteous in all the earth who can do good and not sin. So don't do any good. Those are indeed two ways in which you could avoid ever sinning. We're not looking for them. <laughs> I'm not saying this tongue in cheek. You ask me, what would this mean in practice? Consider someone who is in a persistent vegetative state. I guarantee he's never sinning. He's not doing any good. He's not doing anything. He may not even really be completely on earth. We want to be on earth <laughs> and doing good. And if we are on earth and we are doing good, then yet yeah, there will be this eventuality that we mess up from time to time. And for that, we have Yom Kippur, the uh, day of purification. Time, the only reason I bring this up is because so many Christians think that uh, Israel finds their justification by the sacrifices as if they were all for intentional sins. And they need to understand the sacrifices that, like the Asham, you know, was for sins of ignorance. Well said. And it's particularly the chatat, the chatat offering, the yep. sin offering. And that really comes from the same root as chet. It only works for the unintentional wrongdoings. Absolutely. Okay, so I'm, is I'm there glad you ever, made that point. Is there ever a sacrifice or a day to cover intentional sins? That's an excellent question. 
And uh, the answer is somewhat complex and it depends on the circumstances, but the truth of the matter is that that's not the requirement in any case for forgiveness, because if you ask, so what is required in order to return to God? It's a, a truism. What's required to return to God is to return to God. That is, um, if I may, I'm, I'll put I'll put another um, another set of biblical verses on the screen right now. Um, one second. But uh, yeah, this this wasn't this is this is um, ad libbing, but um, it's important. I, I want to share, share this point because I think what Pastor Mark is introducing here is something that is just so solidly crucial that it, it's important to put in the effort to considering this. Uh, so let me just get this out of here. Um, so here we go. I have to admit, this is always um, a little bit of a, uh, technical challenge for me to get this right. So if I goof up, okay. Emil, please be forbearing. Uh, okay, I'm going to, here we go. Let's see if this works. Uh, okay, I think it worked, although I think that my other source sheet now I have to <laughs> fill into the background. But in any case, you see right now Ezekiel chapter 18? Yes. Okay, so we, we get a very detailed presentation in chapter 18 and also chapter 33. Um, if the wicked return from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. For his righteousness that he has done, he shall live have I any desire at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not rather that he should return from his ways and live? By the way, that's one of the verses that we recite in the final service on Yom Kippur, in emphasizing this point. And the prophet continues, again, when the wicked man lived a life of wickedness, he turns away from his wickedness that he has committed and does justice and righteousness, he shall save his soul alive because he saw and turned away from all his transgressions that he has committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. Cast away from you all your transgressions within, with, where, wherein you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. The summons. Return to God and live. And likewise, in Ezekiel chapter 33, I'm just excerpting briefly because I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but this is important. Uh, verse 11, say unto them, as I live, God is swearing, says the Lord God, I have no desire for the death of the wicked, but that the wicked return from his way and uh, live. You return yeah. you, return you from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? This also, by the way, we recite in the final service on Yom Kippur. And in verse 12, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression, and as for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not stumble thereby in the day that he returns from his wickedness. Verse 14, again, when I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die if he returns from his sin and does justice and righteousness. If the wicked return, the, return, restore the pledge, give back that which he has taken by robbery, walk in the statutes of life, committing no iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done justice and righteousness, he shall surely live. And when the wicked returns from his wickedness and does that which is lawful and right, justice and righteousness, he shall live thereby. And there are many additional passages that we could cite here. Of course, uh, King David's Psalm after the sin of Bathsheba and many verses from Isaiah. I'm really not going to go through them all in detail because then we won't have time for anything other than this. But there are so many, so many passages in which we, we read the message that if you ask, so what does it take to return to God? It takes returning to God. Period. There's nothing else. And um, maybe just one other point that 
I feel compelled to share with you, and that is the central theme of repentance. So what's the Hebrew word for repentance? Teshuva. Okay, everyone, I, I'm sure on some level has heard this, this word teshuva. And it doesn't mean repentance. But, you know, one of the great scholars of the last generation, Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, points out that we have an excellent, rigorous definition of what teshuva means. Let me just get to the appropriate page here. Uh, but by the way, this is from the uh, souvenir tour book that goes with the Holy City tour, which, God willing, we're hoping to be doing in December, right? God willing. Anyway, um, I bring us to first book of Samuel, chapter 7. At the end of chapter 7, we read about Samuel as judge of Israel. And, you know, he was what we would describe in contemporary terms as a circuit judge. The circuit judge goes from one place to another and, and judges the people in all these places. So we read the circuit in verse 16, which is the next to last verse of the chapter. And he judges Israel in all those places. And then he gets to the final verse of the, of the chapter. And his teshuva doesn't mean repentance here, his return was to Ramah because that's where his home was. So commented Rabbi Salvechik, definition of teshuva, returning home, period. That's all it takes. You know that when you return home, your loving father is there, so to speak, hands outstretched, waiting to greet you waiting to welcome you all it takes is to return home and that of course inevitably is going to be a central theme okay now let's get back to yom kippur but that's a central theme of this purification from all that we did that was wrong and again that aspect of purification let's just switch our source sheets again um I hope everyone sees this again. Um, second. Here we go, one second. So the, 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 that's the third vertex, if you will, in talking about Yom Kippur. There is the afflicting your lives. There is the refraining from creative labor because it is a Sabbath of solemn rest. And there is this aspect of purification from sin and it's in that vein that we read the summation in verses 33 and 34 he shall make atonement for the most holy place and he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly and this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make atonement for the children of israel because of all their sins once in the year this, the synopsis of Yom Kippur. But now, inevitably, next stage in this process, I reiterate, what does this word that we're rendering as atonement really mean? So we refer to Yom Kippur. In the Bible, it's actually Yom HaKippurim, which is simply the pluralized version of the same word. But you know, in biblical Hebrew, as we noted in a different context last time, you always have to look for the three-letter root. So the three-letter root of Kippur, Lechaper, in the Hebrew, for the Hebrew experts, is Kaf Pei Resh. What does it mean? So, you know, in a similar vein to our citation of First Book of Samuel, Chapter 7, let's start out by looking for places where the three-letter root appears, and it has nothing to do with sin. Because actually the first contexts in which it appears in the Bible don't have anything to do with sin. But let's see if we can figure out what this root really means. Where's the first place that it appears? First place that it appears is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. Make you an ark of gopher wood with rooms shall you make the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. 
I don't see anything about sin and, and atonement here. Do you? No, of course not. But I do see this word, v'chafarta, and kofer, with the same three-letter root. And those are the words that mean you shall pitch it with pitch. Interesting, isn't it? wonder what that tells us about what this root means in the context of sin and atonement. Because that's the first place. Second place, we skip to Genesis chapter 32. In Genesis chapter 32, we are under dire circumstances. Jacob is getting ready for his encounter with Esau, who is coming toward him with 400 armed men. And he comes up with the idea of sending a gift. And he sets out the messengers with the very lavish gift. And in verse 21, we read, and you shall say, moreover, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, Jacob said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. And afterward, I will see his face for adventure. He will accept me. The truth of the matter is the Hebrew doesn't say appease. The Hebrew says, achapera. And the Hebrew experts may discern the same three-letter root. Literally, what it means here is, I will cover over Esau's countenance of wrath by sending this lavish gift and calm him down. Okay, so pitch, covering over the face of wrath. Let's go on to the third place. The third place is in Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, of course, is all about the manna. And we read in verse 14, when the layer of dew was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness was a grain-like, flaky, bare thing, fine as the hoarfrost on the earth. Where is the three-letter root here? Ah, it's the frost. The frost is kfar in Hebrew. Now, I just want to stress this point for the linguists. There's a word in Hebrew for snow. That's sheleg. There's a word in Hebrew for ice. That's kerach. Those are totally unrelated words. This word is specifically for frost. What's the characteristic of frost? When the air is cold enough, frost forms on various surfaces and covers the surface. That's kefor. You may already be discerning where this is heading in terms of our etymological analysis. But there's one additional place where this root appears and appears repeatedly before we ever encounter atonement in the Bible. And the first place is in Exodus chapter 25, where we read about the ark cover. The ark cover in Hebrew is called the kaporet. Same root letters. Kaf, pe, resh. So, taking these four usages together, what does lechaper mean when it pertains to sin? And I think the answer ought to be at least starting to get obvious here. What do all those four usages have in common? All about, what's the key word? Covering. That is, you build this ark, you cover all of the wood with pitch. And both the verb for covering with pitch and the covering itself, the pitch, are from this root. When Jacob is trying to assuage Esau's wrath, he wants to cover over the anger by sending this lavish gift. And that's the same root, achapara. When we talk about frost, it's not snow and it's not ice, it's what covers the ground. And what covers the ground is kfor, same root. And of course, the ark cover. Obviously, the ark cover is, an, is a covering. So that's the same root, kaporet. And how does this bear on lechaper when it comes to sin? And this is, I think, so profound. And so moving for mm. ourselves as human beings. We are constantly on a journey in life. We're moving through time. 
and it is almost exclusively a one-way street. You can't revisit the past. If I mess up, I messed up. Can't go back and fix up what I've messed up because it's messed. What's done is done and cannot be undone. Yes, but. So on the ultimate level, there is this extraordinary gift that God gives us that is teshuva, repentance. And repentance indeed includes as part of the package a virtual time machine. It really enables me to fix up what I did in the past. This is an extraordinary act of grace by God. And, you know, it's not incidental to note here in our tradition, God created repentance before he created the world. Of course, before, obviously, we don't mean anything literal here because there is no before, before there was time and time was created in creation. And Okay, realize, we're not talking literally here. But there's some sense in which repentance is even more foundational than the world itself. And what that means is there's that arrow of time that is inescapable in this world and repentance brings me beyond the arrow of time. It's an extraordinary gift. On the one hand, extraordinary. On the other hand, you know, to really be able to get to that level, completely erasing what I did, that takes some heavy lifting. Sometimes there are things that get in the way. And it isn't possible to right now achieve that exalted level. And then there's the danger that I'll become paralyzed by what I did. And that's the worst of the worst because if we become paralyzed by our wrongdoings, we have no way of moving forward. And the greatest, most sacred summons in life is to keep on going. And here's where Yom Kippur, Kippurim, comes in. It's covering. If I'm not at a stage where I can erase the past, at the very least, God says, let's cover this over and move on. And maybe once you're able to move on and pick yourself up by your proverbial bootstraps and move forward, then you'll be able to revisit the past and do complete teshuva. But at the very least, cover it over, keep moving. Don't be paralyzed by the past. The past can paralyze. Don't be paralyzed. Keep moving. And it is then in that vein that we appreciate what most essentially Yom Kippur entails for us. Again, whether this translates to atonement or not, I haven't a clue. It's a day of covering over the past to enable us to move forward. And we do this, first and foremost, in the prescription that we saw in Leviticus chapter 16, through refraining from creative labor and through afflicting our lives. Now, we should note, the next time that we encounter this day in the Bible is in Leviticus chapter 23, in the cycle of the Holy Days. We talked a lot about Leviticus chapter 23 last time with respect to Rosh Hashanah, where it appears for the first time. And again, you see these same two themes. On the 10th day of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement, and you shall afflict your soul, your lives. And you shall do no manner of work in that same day, for it is the Day of Atonement. And, and there's a warning here for whatsoever life it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. And whatsoever soul it be that does any manner of work in that same day, that's all I will, will I destroy from among his people. 
So we have these two imperatives of not doing work and afflicting your lives. And it shall be unto you a Sabbath of solemn rest. You shall afflict your lives in the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening to evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. So again, these two motifs of not engaging in, the translation reads work, but we should probably translate it better as creative labor, and afflicting your lives. And the third place, the third and final place, that this day appears in the five books of Moses, in, in Numbers chapter 29, again, both of these themes. On the 10th day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall afflict your lives, and you shall do no manner of work. And inevitably, we need to understand what these two aspects are in our observance of this day. With respect to refraining from work, again, I'm, I'm stressing that it's creative labor. We should inevitably think back, have recourse to where we first encounter a Sabbath of ceasing from creative labor. That would be Genesis chapter 2, and it's talking about God. That is, that on the seventh day, God finished his work again, his creative labor, which he had made, and he ceased on the seventh day from all of his work, milacha, creative labor, that he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because in it he ceased from all of his creative labor, which God had created to do. So that's the theme of desisting from any work, any creative labor on the Sabbath. And uh, for the record, the only day besides the Sabbath on which all creative labor is forbidden is Yom Kippur. So that certainly is a central theme that pertains to Yom Kippur. There are the other major festivals, but the restriction on doing work is one that is somewhat qualified. That is, one is permitted to prepare food, which in includes cooking, which is something that on the Sabbath and on Yom Kippur we do not do. So that theme then of rest from creative labor, essential to the Sabbath, it's central to Yom Kippur. And yet, you know, these two themes on Yom Kippur, afflicting your life and the Sabbath, they seem to be at loggerheads with one another, don't they? I mean, Sabbath is a day of delight. You enjoy the Sabbath. You're afflicting your lives on Yom Kippur. That's not a day of enjoyment. And, you know, inevitably... A practical question arises here. You know, Yom Kippur can take place on various days of the week. To be precise, in our calendar, it could take place on four of the seven days of the week. But one of those days is the Sabbath, Shabbat. In point of fact, that's exactly the day of the week on which Yom Kippur falls this year. So how do these seemingly conflicting themes coexist? The Sabbath is a day of delight. So when Yom Kippur comes on the Sabbath, how are we supposed to delight on the Sabbath? Should we be eating and drinking? Should we be fasting? Good question. And here's where I need to revisit one of the questions that we left dangling at the outset. And that is, the Torah never said that you're supposed to fast on Yom Kippur. It said you're supposed to afflict your lives. We understand that means fasting, but there's a verb for fasting, and it doesn't appear in any of the Bible's references to Yom Kippur. Where does it appear? Well, perhaps most essentially, not exclusively, but most essentially, it appears in Zechariah chapter seven and specifically the response that god gives 
to the inquiry in chapter 7 that takes place in chapter 8. In chapter 7, we read of a question. You know, much as to this day, people send questions to rabbis pertaining to how to live according to the laws of the Torah. This question is sent by these various men to entreat the favor of the Lord, to speak unto the priests of the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets, saying, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself as I have done these so many years? What are they talking about? What's the fifth month? So, of course, by, exactly. But by simple reckoning, of course, we, we count the months from the month of the Exodus. The fifth month is the month of Av. When they're asking about weeping in the month of Av, we realize that as recorded explicitly in both the end of the book of Kings and in the, ben the end of the book of Jeremiah, the temple is destroyed in the month of Av. The question with respect to the exact date. The first temple was destroyed in the month of Av. The second temple was destroyed in the month of Av. And this is just after the second temple has been rebuilt. And the people are asking, am I supposed to keep on mourning the destruction of the first temple in the month of Av? And here's where we encounter the actual verb for fasting. Verses 4 and on, then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the beasts, saying, When you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even these 70 years, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? And when you eat and you drink, are you not they that eat and they that drink? Okay, so, again, Hebrew lesson, fasting. Samtem, hatsom tzamatuni. The root for fasting is tzam, som. The three root letters being tzadi, vav, mem. Totally different root from anything that we encountered with respect to Yom Kippur. Now, you might be wondering, in God's response, there is reference to fasting in the fifth and seventh months. So you might be thinking, ah, the fifth month fast is the fast for the destruction. What we observe as the ninth of Av is the seventh month fast, Yom Kippur. It's a tantalizing possibility, isn't it? It just so happens it's all wrong. And it becomes clear that it's wrong when we consider God's final definitive answer in Zechariah chapter 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh month, the fast of the tenth month. And in each case, the word that appears is som. Som, which is a word that in the Bible is applied to Yom Kippur on exactly zero occasions. Those fasts will be to the house of Judah, joy and gladness and cheerful seasons, but love you, truth and peace. There are four fast days that are listed here. The fast of the fourth month, which we observe in the month before of the, uh, the fast of Tammuz, the fast of the fifth, which we already discussed, the fast of the destruction, the fast of the seventh, what took place in the seventh month. What took place in the seventh month that is critically relevant with respect to the destruction of the temple is the assassination of Gedaliah ben Achikam, who had been established as the representative of Babylon over the Jews who remained in the land, and that resulted in the utmost abandonment of the land of Israel for the 70 years of exile. And the fast of the 10th month, the fast of the 10th month being the day upon which the siege was established round about Jerusalem. The fast of the seventh month then to which God refers in chapter 7 is the same fast about which we really read in chapter 8. It's the fast that commemorates the assassination of Gedaliah and it pertains to the events of the destruction. We observe that fast day in most years, the day after Rosh Hashanah. This year, it will be one day later. Why? This is critical. 
because the day after Rosh Hashanah this year is the Sabbath, Shabbat. These fast days are on some plane diametric opposites of the celebration of Shabbat. They are days of mourning. You never mourn on Shabbat. And let me stress this point. As I'm sure you're aware, there is the ancient practice of a seven-day mourning period after the death of an immediate relative. When Shabbat comes, as inevitably it must, during that seven-day mourning period, all public mourning practices are suspended because it would be an affront to Shabbat to show publicly practices of mourning on Shabbat. These four fast days are days of mourning. What happens if they coincide with Shabbat? They are postponed to the next day, as indeed will be taking place this coming week with respect to the fast of Gedalia that won't be observed on the third day of Tishrei, but rather on the fourth. What happens when Yom Kippur takes place on Shabbat, as it indeed does this year? Of course, we fast. One could seek a legalistic explanation and say that these four fast days are not explicitly in, in, engendered by the mandate of the Torah. They aren't of the clout of Torah law, and therefore the observance of Shabbat takes precedence over them. But again, I'm going to stress, these four fast days contradict the celebration of Shabbat as a day of delight, because you don't mourn publicly on Shabbat. Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is a whole different story. That afflicting of our lives isn't intended as torment. It certainly is not for the purpose of mourning. And as a result, Yom Kippur is never described as a fast day, even if in practice we're fasting. It's described as afflicting our physical lives with the emphasis on physicality in order to attain a level of transcendence. And you know, perhaps one of the most vivid expressions of this verity is, we go back to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 32, it shall be unto you a Sabbath of solemn rest and you shall afflict your lives in the ninth day of the month at evening, from evening unto evening, you shall rest for your Sabbath. And, of course, the obvious question that this verse raises is, ninth day? It's the tenth day. Every passage that we saw in the Bible presented Yom Kippur as the tenth day of the seventh month. So why here is it the ninth day at evening? It's the tenth day at evening. So, of course, you might say, well, you know, it's the end of the ninth day, which is the evening of the tenth day when the fast begins. Which, of course, is true. But, hey, we already know about that. After all, from the get-go, we read in the story of creation, and there was evening and there was morning one day, that the evening comes before the morning. So, we know very well that the fast of the tenth day begins at evening on the ninth day. Why emphasize the ninth day? And, and here's where I need to share with you what you might consider to be a, a mystifying tradition that we have. And that is, on the ninth day, there is a categorical mandate, an imperative to do what? to eat and drink without limit at all. You might think that, hey, if the objective is to fast on the 10th day to afflict your life, then torment is a great thing. So if I can prepare for it by fasting for an extra day, and then when I get into Yom Kippur, I am in the second day of fasting, then that would be even better, right? Wrong. Totally wrong. So wrong, we actually have a tradition that 
when one eats and drinks on the ninth day, ninth day, it is reckoned by God as if one is fasting for that day. I'm not fasting, I'm eating and drinking. Yes, but I'm preparing for the fast day. But there's more to it than that. And if I, if I can share with you, in this regard, a comment by one of the great Bible scholars of the 19th century, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, who wrote a commentary on all the five books of Moses and also on the book of Psalms. Uh, he was the rabbi in Frankfurt, the Main. The commentary actually he wrote in German. I'm going to read it in English translation. The prohibition to fast on the ninth, on the eve of Yom Kippur, may to a very high degree prove the moral Jewish character of our fasting on Yom Kippur and allow us to understand the words of the sages that one who eats and drinks on the ninth is reckoned by scripture as if fasting on both the ninth and the tenth. And he continues, if our Yom Kippur were the heathenish idea of pacifying a wrathful God and our fasting a heathenist self-torturing castigation to satisfy its thirst for vengeance. How much greater would be the commandment by a two-day fast? The law which makes eating and drinking on the eve of Yom Kippur into precisely a mitzvah, a precept, an imperative, and which forbids fasting on that day comes to oppose sharply this immoral and un-Jewish way of looking at Yom Kippur. Our eating on the eve of Yom Kippur is a suitable expression for giving our fasting on Yom Kippur the true meaning of a kapara, the covering over of our wrongdoings, promised on Yom Kippur and only on Yom Kippur. But we don't fast two days. On the contrary, this engagement in afflicting of our lives. Again, I'm going to stress, the Hebrew is afflicting of our nefesh, which is the physical life force, is the means to being able to attain transcendence. We have no directive to divorce ourselves from our this worldly lives. On the contrary, as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, be not righteous over much, neither make yourself otherwise. Why should you become desolate? Why should you become desolate? Why divorce yourself from your this worldly life? So if we're not supposed to make ourselves desolate, we're not supposed to separate ourselves from this world, then why altogether refraining from food and drink on Yom Kippur. And my response on the most basic plane is we have a template for this. First, I'll stress a template of two singular individuals. The first is Moses. We read in Exodus chapter 34, and he, Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. For he, God, wrote upon the tablets the words of the covenant, the 10 words. And we read this theme again in the retrospective in Deuteronomy chapter 9. When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tablets of stone, even the tablets of the covenant which the Lord made with you, when then I abode in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water. And what took place at the end of these 40 days and 40 nights was the debacle of the sin of the golden calf. What happens immediately afterward? Moses goes back up the mountain to entreat God for forgiveness. And I fell down before the Lord as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sin, which you had sinned. And in our tradition, the actual reckoning is Moses for three 40-day periods goes without eating or drinking. 
The third time he goes up to receive the, the second set of tablets. But he's gone 120 days without eating and drinking. So how did he survive? And of course, what's the answer? I was with the Lord. Excuse me, I was with the Lord. Do you think I needed to eat and drink physical food and drink water? I was at a level of transcendence in which physical needs simply evaporated. Maybe even more tellingly, when we consider the second individual, the prophet Elijah, who is described in the first book of Kings, chapter 19. Elijah lay down and slept under a juniper, and behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on the hot stones and a cruise of water, and he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, before the journey, because the journey is too great for you. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meal 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Same place as in the case of Moses. And also 40 days and 40 nights without eating and drinking. He was with the Lord. He didn't need to eat and drink. You know, uh, there is this um, uh, epigram of one of the Hasidic masters that you have these two days upon which we go without eating and drinking for around 25 hours. The ninth of Av, that commemorates the destruction of the Holy Temple and all the calamities that befell us since, and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. On the ninth of Av, we don't eat because experiencing such destruction, who can possibly think of eating or drinking? On Yom Kippur, we're with God. We don't eat and drink us when you're with God. Who altogether can't even think about eating and drinking? We're beyond it. So maybe we're not completely beyond it. But Yom Kippur is the closest we get to that transcendence. And, you know, it's significant to note that, well, of course, Moses and Elijah are really the exemplars of this transcendence. You know, when we read in Deuteronomy chapter 29, I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes did not wax and old upon you and your shoe did not, was not wax and old upon your feet. You have not eaten bread, neither have you drunk wine or strong drink that you might know that I am the Lord your God. Hey, that wasn't just 40 days and 40 nights. It was 40 years. Of course, we realized they weren't actually starving for those 40 years. They were eating manna. But what is manna? In Psalm 78, which is really all about the events of the Exodus, we read, and he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He caused manna to rain upon them for food and gave them of the corn of heaven. Man did eat the bread of the mighty or of the angels, perhaps the mighty angels. He sent them provisions for satisfaction. They weren't eating bread or drinking water. They were eating manna. Angel food. Obviously not in some rigorous literal sense, because angels are incorporeal beings. They don't need any kind of food. But on some plane in our tradition, the manna is a kind of corporealization of the divine radiance, the divine splendor. It is indeed transcendence. And isn't that the same idea? That is, you go beyond physicality. And, of course, it is in that vein that we appreciate precisely what the greatness of Yom Kippur is in attaining this level of transcendence that we become as the eaters of the manna, angel-like. Angel-like. Yom Kippur, the day that you become like an angel. Except there's one major problem that we need to contemplate with respect to becoming angel-like. And that is, excuse me, what's so great about being like an angel? In our tradition, human beings can be greater than angels. You know where we see this so aptly expressed in the Bible? Perhaps most aptly in Daniel chapter 3. You know, in Daniel chapter 3, where 
Hananya, Mishael, and Azariah are cast into the fiery furnace. And we read in verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar, the king was alarmed and he rose up in haste. He spoke and said to his ministers, did, he, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt and the appearance of the fourth resembles an angel. So of course we understand what took place. God sent the angel to save the righteous men from the fiery furnace. But you know, we pay attention to all the details in the text. Okay, so the angel send, saves these three righteous men and they're walking in the midst of the furnace. Who is in front and who picks up the rear? The righteous are in front. The angel is in fourth place. The righteous are greater than angels. The righteous are greater than angels because after all, the righteous needed to actualize a spiritual potential. The angels are created with that potential already actualized. There is no potential. They're just actual. So the righteous are greater. We can glean this on an additional plane in considering what takes place in the famous struggle between Jacob and the angel. In Genesis chapter 32, Jacob was left alone and they wrestled the man with him until the breaking of the dawn. And ultimately, Jacob prevails against this man who it emerges is an angel. And Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name will be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with godly beings, with angels of God, and with men, and have prevailed. Again, the righteous is the one who has the upper hand with respect to the angel. Likewise, as we read it in Hosea chapter 12, he strove with an angel and prevailed. He, the angel, wept and made supplication unto him. At Bethel he would find him. There he would speak with us. But the angel is in the inferior position. And likewise, we noted this in other contexts as well. In Zechariah chapter 3, when the prophet Zechariah is charged with conveying this blessing from God to Joshua the high priest. The angel of the Lord forewarned Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, and will also judge my house, and will also keep my courts, then I will give you walkers among these standing ones. Your translations may differ. I'm translating literally from the Hebrew. I will give you walkers among these standing ones. What is it talking about? Walkers, standing ones? The angels are the standing ones. As we read in the first chapter of Ezekiel, their legs were straight legs. They turned not when they went, they went everyone straight forward. Angels are static beings. They are created as spiritual beings and so they remain. And who is the walking one? Man. Because that's what being a human being is all about. You come into this world, a newborn baby, completely a physical being. There's no actual spirituality in a newborn. It's all potential, and it's all latent. And all of life is the ongoing struggle to actualize that spiritual potential with which we are endowed, but endowed only in a latent form. And it is in that vein that we can well appreciate the message in the book of Job, chapter 5, verse 7. Man is born unto labor, but the flying beings fly upward. The flying beings, those are the angels. They fly upward. They soar. No problem. Man, man is born to labor. It's always a struggle. And it's precisely because it is always a struggle that man is greater than the angel. As a further elaboration on this theme, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it's important to note the most common word in the Bible for angels is malachim. Now, malachim literally means messengers. And we see malachim as a term that is used for messengers, not in an angelic sense, 
repeatedly in scripture. I'm not going to elaborate on all these instances in which it appears because I realize our time is limited. But Malachim appears as messengers repeatedly in scripture. And my point in emphasizing this is simply when you send a messenger to someone else, isn't it always presumed that the messenger is of lesser rank than the one to whom the messenger is being sent? You may send a commoner as a messenger to a king. Would you ever send the king as a messenger to a commoner? So if the angels are being sent as messengers, messengers to humanity, who's on the higher level? So we're on a higher level than angels. That's precisely the summons of being the righteous. And of course, Inevitably, to that extent, we well appreciate that there isn't anything at all rarefied, exalted, the utmost goal in becoming like an angel. You know, ironically, it is in this vein that we appreciate the sales pitch of the snake in paradise in the Garden of Eden, that when you eat of the tree of knowing good and evil, you will be as angels, as great ones, knowing good and evil. And that's what happened. Their eyes were opened and they knew. And God says, behold, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. So we have this unique status. What is then the role of Yom Kippur given that the ultimate birthright of man, righteous man, is to transcend the level of the angel? That is, again, just to make sure we're we're on the same page, so to speak. We recognize that this theme of afflicting your lives in order to transcend the physical world is one of the central themes on Yom Kippur. And it's not in order to suffer, and that's why it's not a contradiction to the Sabbath rest of Yom Kippur. Both the Sabbath rest and the afflicting of our physical lives are means to attaining transcendence. But what's the purpose of transcendence? We don't want to be angel-like. We want to transcend the level of the angels. And inevitably, our response is true, but, but, you know, that sounds like a really lofty goal. How easy is it to actualize it versus how easy is it to get ourselves distracted? You know, in Exodus chapter 9, we read a really straightforward, basic definition of what it means to be God-fearing. When Moses declares to Pharaoh and his servants that plague number seven is on the way. Plague number seven is the plague of hail. And he makes it very clear what kind of hail this is going to be. In verse 18, Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the day it was founded, even until now. Now therefore, send, hasten, in your cattle and all you have in the field. For every man and beast that shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. So basic definition of what it means to be God-fearing. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. To which I will comment, well, you know, it's nice that they were God-fearing. It doesn't exactly take such a lofty level of being God-fearing to make the calculation that this Moses guy has already gone six for six. He might go seven for seven. 
So this plague of hail might happen. And if I don't chase my livestock and servants into the houses beforehand, then I'm cooked. So, okay, we appreciate he that feared the word of God. It's not exactly a very high level of fearing the word of God. Indeed, in our tradition, these guys were the ones who provided Pharaoh with his cavalry to, to chase after the people of Israel to the Red Sea. But what seems completely mind-boggling is how can anyone not do that? To not even entertain the possibility that hell is going to come the next day when Moses is already gone six for six? And if we ask how could it be that anyone didn't, the next verse gives us the answer. And he that put it, not his heart or paid no attention to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. There were those who were God-fearing. There were those who just didn't pay attention. Uh, one of my mentors would point to these verses and say, this is the definition of being God-fearing. Most basic definition, pay attention. Don't be distracted. But oh, how often it is it that we become distracted and we don't pay attention. And we need to get, to get grounded, to get recalibrated, to realize where we need to be. To put this in, uh, in other somewhat analogous terms. Back in, in Genesis chapter one, in the story of creation, on, on the third day of creation, we read in verse 11, God said, let the earth put forth grass, herbs yielding seed, and literally, trees of fruit bearing fruit. That's the terminology in the Hebrew. Eitz pri osepri, trees of fruit bearing fruit. And that's not what, the earth produced. The earth produced, in verse 12, trees bearing fruit. But the Bible doesn't say they were trees of fruit bearing fruit. You may say we're quibbling. To which we'll respond, these are the words of God. <laughs> we pay attention to detail. But what indeed is the difference between trees of fruit bearing fruit and trees bearing fruit? So in our tradition, God summons trees of fruit bearing fruit was that the taste of the tree would be like the taste of the fruit. The wood of the tree would take, taste like fruit. But the earth didn't deliver. The earth delivered trees that bear fruit, but the trees aren't fruit. Now, parenthetically, just so you'll know, there, there is one exception to this. There is a tree that tastes like fruit. Did you ever taste the wood of an etrog tree? I did. I once saw an etrog tree growing in the wild, and I figured, this is my chance. I got to check this out. And I broke off a twig. And it tastes just like an etrog. <laughs> but, um, but with that solitary exception, trees that bear fruit don't taste like fruit. And what's the significance of the difference between these two? So one of the great scholars of a couple of generations ago, Rabbi Abraham Isaac HaKohen Cook, the chief rabbi of the land of Israel during the British mandate, commented here that in our frame of reference, you know, when you have a fruit-bearing tree, the tree is the means, the fruit is the end. And the divine summons was a world in which you would be able to sense the end, the goal, in the means as well. That the tree itself would taste like fruit. Obviously, this is a metaphor, but a very deep metaphor. In our world, it doesn't work like that. There's the means, there's the end. It's not the same. You don't taste the end, the end goal in the means. And that's one of the tragedies of this world. Because, you know, really, on some level, I won't say the root of all sin, but it's pretty close. One of the major issues of our undoing is we confuse means with end. We take something that might even be legitimate, lofty, exalted means to the ultimate end, and we make it into an end in itself. You know what we call that? That's paganism. That's exactly paganism. 
taking something that's a means and making it into an end in itself. And again, that's part of being distracted. We lose sight of the ultimate goal. We fixate on the here and now. We forget where we're supposed to, where we're supposed to be going. And, and that's another expression, again, essentially, of if you don't pay attention, there's no limit to how far off you can get. And so you have Yom Kippur. Realignment, recalibrate. Get your sights back on what the ultimate goal is. It is precisely in this vein that we appreciate the message in Deuteronomy chapter 8 when Moses says to the people of Israel, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might afflict you. And the word for afflicting here is exactly the same word as afflicting your lives on Yom Kippur. Afflict you and test you to know what was in your heart. Will you keep his commandments or not? And he afflicted you. Again, same word. And caused you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you knew not, neither did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread only, but by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. Get your sights on the right place. What are the means? What's the goal? And indeed, it is in this vein that we consider the thrust of what we read in Psalm 139. It's a cryptic, enigmatic verse. Your eyes did see my unformed substance, and in your book they were all written. Even the days have been formed, and one of them is his. So again, it's a cryptic verse. Your translations may differ. It's a translation coming directly from the Hebrew. You have all these days of the year, and all these days of the year when, truth be told, we can get ourselves distracted. Distracted all over the place. And one of them is his. And one of the ancient interpretations of that verse, these words, one of them is his, Yom Kippur is God's. Yom Kippur is the day of getting your sights in the right place. Focus on what really matters, on what the real goal is. And you know, once that happens, we appreciate Yom Kippur is not about denial. On the contrary, it's about actualization. When we read in Psalm 36, how precious is your loving kindness, O God, and the children of men take refuge in the shadow of your wings, they are abundantly satisfied with the fatness of your house and you make them drink of the river of your pleasures. For with you is the source of life. In your light do we see light. Are we talking about physical sustenance here? Of course not. The fatness of your house, the river of your pleasures. Likewise, in Proverbs chapter 16, in the light of the king's countenance is life, and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. It is precisely through that intimacy with God that we attain the transcendence and the ultimate satisfaction. Psalm 63, my soul is satisfied as with choice foods and fatness. My mouth does praise you with joyful lips. My soul is satisfied. I've afflicted my body and now my soul is preeminent. Psalm 111, he has given food unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. Because really, ultimately, that sustenance is something that comes from the Lord. And in this vein, likewise, we read in Isaiah chapter 55, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsts, come you for water. And he that has no money, come, buy, eat, come. By wine and milk without money and without price. We're not talking about physical wine and physical uh, uh, milk. 
Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and your gain for that which is which does not satisfy? Hearken diligently unto me, says God, and eat you that which is good and let your soul delight in its fatness. Not in physical sustenance, but this is something that goes far beyond that. And again, in that vein, likewise, in Nehemiah chapter 9, You are the Lord, even you alone. You have made heaven, the heavens of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth, and all things that are thereon, the seas, and all that is in them. And you give life to them all. And the host of heaven prostrates themselves before you. God is the ultimate sustainer. And when we, on some plane, you know, divorce ourselves from the mundane sustenance of the food and drink, then we're able to really feel that the sustenance is something that comes truly from God. Mm -hmm. And you know, inevitably then, it's in this vein that we appreciate the message of Yom Kippur. But um, this one final dimension that I still feel compelled to share. And that brings us back to the cessation of all creative labor, which again is something that is joint for both the Sabbath, Shabbat, and Yom Kippur. Because I'm sure from everything that we said until now, there is so much deeper a feeling of what Yom Kippur is about as this day of transcendence that enables us to rise above the physical, to reorient ourselves, not because we want to be angels. No, 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 no. We want to be greater than angels. We have it within ourselves. God endows human beings with a wherewithal through righteousness to attain a level that's higher than the angels. But we realize that we get ourselves distracted. We get ourselves disoriented. We get ourselves misaligned. We need Yom Kippur to get back on track. The transcendence that ultimately informs our worldliness. Because the goal isn't transcendence. The goal is in this world to be adherent to God. And all of this, of course, is, is central. And all of this is completely true. But, you know, there's, there's just one final issue that I need to make sure is completely clear. Because, you know, you might have thought from everything we discussed until now that we're talking about Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, right? But, you know, what's the holiest day of the year? It's not Yom Kippur. The holiest day of the year is the day that we read about at the beginning of Exodus chapter 35 that you see on the screen. It's the Sabbath. And I have no further to look than chapter 35, verse 2, in order to make it clear that indeed the Sabbath is the more sacred day because you know, the punishment for violating Yom Kippur is very severe, is being cut off from one's people. But the most severe punishment in the Torah is capital punishment. Granted, it was hardly ever inf enforced. A, a court that killed one criminal in 70 years was considered to be a killer court. <clears throat> but on the books... Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh there shall be to you a holy Sabbath, a Sabbath of solemn rest of the Lord. Whosoever does any work therein shall be put to death. The Sabbath is more severe than Yom Kippur. I'll also illustrate that on an additional plane. The number of passages from the Torah that we read, there's a hierarchy here. When we read the Torah, on an ordinary day of the week, like every Monday and Thursday. Also, the post-biblical holidays, like the holiday of Hanukkah, the holiday of Purim, then the Torah reading consists of three passages being read. 
Then there are the minor holidays, like the intermediate days of the festival, or like the new moon. On those days, there are four passages read from the Torah. Then there are the major holy days, the major festivals. They include the three pilgrimage feasts. They also include Rosh Hashanah. And on those days, five passages from the Torah are read. And then there is Yom Kippur. <clears throat> on Yom Kippur, six passages are read, which you might think is the ultimate in terms of the number of passages that we read in order to exemplify the unique stature of the day. But um, every single Shabbat, you know, we read seven passages. So there are those who might recoil from this message and say, this is dreadful. Are you making holiness into a routine? To which our rejoinder is precisely the routine becomes holy. The holiest day of the year occurs once every seven days. It is the Sabbath. Yom Kippur, on some level, is precisely intended as a lead up to that. You know, apropos of the words that we read from Psalm 139. Days have been formed and one of them is his. I mentioned the interpretation that one of them is his refers to Yom Kippur. I'm sure it comes as no surprise that there's another interpretation that no, one of them is his refers to the Sabbath. That's the day that's God's day on a weekly basis. And what's so important about this is it brings us to a newfound appreciation of what the fast of Yom Kippur really is all about. Now, Isaiah chapter 58 isn't about Yom Kippur. How do I know it's not about Yom Kippur? Because it uses the word fast, and we never find the word fast associated with Yom Kippur in the Bible. But it does talk about a fast day. And there's a message here. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the fetters of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry, that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house? When you see the naked, that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light break forth as the morning, and your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rearward. Then shall you call and the Lord will answer and you will cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away from the midst of you the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking wickedness. That's really what Yom Kippur is about. It's the transcendence ultimately, of restoration of justice and equity to the world. And the reason I'm mentioning this specifically here is, isn't it interesting how in the two final verses of this passage about fasting, we read about the Sabbath. If you turn away your foot because of the Sabbath from pursuing your business on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable and shall honor it not doing your wanted ways, nor pursuing your business, or speaking thereof. Then shall you delight yourself in the Lord, and I will make you to ride upon the high places of the earth, and I will feed you with the inheritance of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And what is this referring to? Again, my holy day. My holy day is the Sabbath. Every seventh day. Transcendence is not an end in itself. Transcendence is means, means to delighting in the Lord. And we experience that delighting in the Lord every week. The Sabbath, for us, is a foretaste of the world to come. 
and um, just to on this note to conclude with two final passages. I hope I'm not overstaying my welcome, but two more two more passages. And with this, we'll conclude. You know what we say at the very end of Yom Kippur? The last word, the last declaration on Yom Kippur. It comes from First Book of Kings, chapter 18. The showdown of Elijah with the pagan prophets of Baal. And the showdown is about God answering Elijah fire upon the altar. And when the people see the fire descending upon the altar, we read in verse 39, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And that's what we declare seven times at the end of Yom Kippur, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And you know what that means more than anything else? That is establishing God as king over everything, as Lord over all the earth. Not transcendence. Transcendence, if it becomes an end in itself, is limiting. Because it means I'm only with God when I'm leaving this world behind. That's not good enough. We have to be with God when I'm in this world. It is when I'm coming down from this level of transcendence of Yom Kippur, The last sound that is reverberating in my ears is the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. That's the message. That's the message. Not transcendence. Not denial. But rather, integrating everything in this world in the way I connect with God. And there's one other final, final postscript on this. And that is, it's not something that we recite, but it's something that in our tradition, God declares at the end of Yom Kippur. These words of Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7. Go your way, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your works. You did your transcendence. Okay, now go and eat your bread with joy and drink your wine with merry heart. There's no time happier than as we go home at the end of Yom Kippur, confident that Yom Kippur through God's grace, has indeed effected in us recalibration, realignment, reorientation, not to stay in that realm of transcendence, but rather to return into this world and to make everything in this world a bastion for God and his service. God bless you. Yay, thank you, thank you. That was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Hey, I have a quick question, and Please. maybe you might comment how it was Jonah and Nineveh, and Nineveh fasted and afflicted themselves, and it seems to be it was at the same time of Yom Kippur. I don't have any chronology for what time of year the story of Nineveh is <clears throat> taking place. We read the book of Jonah, Right, in the afternoon service of Yom Kippur. Right, but you know, I, I, I don't. We certainly learn from the people of Nineveh a message in returning to God, but you know, I, I would describe that, and this is a little bit of a lead up to discussing Sukkot. I would describe that message of just how great the gift of repentance is, as so central to the Book of Jonah. It is the second most important message in the book of Jonah. But only the second most important. Yeah, well, what's That's fascinating is at the very end, what does he do? He sits under a sukkah, which, you know, kind of showing that uh, time what's, frame. What's, you know, what's the message? What's the message that God imparts to Jonah in that sukkah? You had... Compassion over this castor oil plant yep. that you didn't grow and you didn't cause to sprout exactly. up that one night was and the next night was not. <clears throat> and I shouldn't have compassion on the people of the great city of Nineveh in which there are 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left hand and much cattle. Exactly. And those are the last words of the book of Jonah. Much cattle. The end. What's yeah. going on? Exactly. What's going on? God is saying, they're all my children. Yeah, 
Right. The, the 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from the left hand, they're my children. Exactly. Even the cattle are my children. Everyone is my children. Yeah. And that's, that's the, one that's other the thing. final most important message of the book of Jonah. Compassion. <laughs> right. Because well, God is a father. One other thing you had mentioned, and I was very well aware of that Moses had fasted 120 days, which is absolutely incredible. But isn't it in Jewish teaching that he comes down on Yom Kippur? Indeed. The, the, our tradition is either on, on the eve of Yom Kippur or on Yom Kippur, but correct. In other words, that the 120 days, I'm not going to say of fasting, of transcending, of leaving the world of physicality, the world of food and, and drink behind, culminate in God's giving him that message of forgiveness that he then takes down the mountain and conveys to Israel. And that's what makes Yom Kippur into this everlasting day of leaving physicality behind and just being there with God and receiving by his grace this message of his forgiveness. What, what, what a, I never, never thought of this till right this moment. And maybe you can help me with this. Here on Yom Kippur, Moses is walking a long distance and he's carrying. He's, he's carrying the commandments and he's walking a long distance. And it's, I, don't, I never saw that till right now. <laughs> Remember, it was only in the wake of that Yom Kippur that the commandment mm. of Yom Kippur was given. So it was still free. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is, remember, this is that this is still in the world of Exodus. We haven't gotten to the world of Leviticus yet. And yeah, right. is in the world of Leviticus. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We sure appreciate. We can hardly wait to hear you on for Sukkot next Sunday. Amen. I'm looking forward. And thank you so very, very much. Do we have time for any questions? Or uh... yeah, if anybody, uh, if they're here, we got time. Anyone have any questions? You got to yes. turn your mic on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm Iria. Um, mm. That's that's great mm. that you can hear me because Where are I, you from? I, I, I'm living in, in Germany. And uh -huh. um, this was just life changing for me. Um, I want to say a heartfelt thank you, Chaim. This Thank was you. a message beyond this world. Um, I have struggled all these years because of these feast days and 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 Shabbat and everything because they are families, they are communities, everybody comes together, and I don't have that. I'm. And I, I feel that I, I fail every single time trying to do all these things on my own. But this is something that doesn't exclude me from taking, taking part in, in Shabbat or any of the feast days on my own, because the message is to be together with God, to find him, to, to spend time with him. Uh, uh, it's a very personal, very deep going, very powerful. Uh, I would almost say allowance. Um, it's definitely not meant that way, but from the perspective where I have been struggling, um, it's like all doors are open for me. I, I can go. I can I can be part of this and I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, God bless you. Thank you for these words that uplift me and I'm sure uplift everyone here. And I'm I'm personally extremely grateful for the encouragement that it gives me. And I completely agree with you. That is while we don't strive to separate ourselves from others we are at times all alone yeah. and it's important for us always to know when we're all alone we're all alone with god that's true we're not alone that's always true we are god's children and we yes. have a loving father who is always with us amen amen
Thank you so, so much. This is so important that you dive deep into the word. Hebraic uh, words, they are just um, a world of their own that we don't understand. And you translate it so that we can understand. So thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Anyone else? I think I saw some other microphones open, so maybe someone okay. else would like to say something. Please. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, so you mentioned, you know, speaking that the Lord is God at the seven times at the end of Yom Kippur. Yes. Does that have any connection to Joshua and the Jericho? This that seven times and Yom Kippur or not at all? That's a fascinating question. Uh, certainly on an explicit plane, you know, as I say, it's not, it's not, it, it's focusing upon God is the Lord, which, which was not a declaration on, you know, in, in uh, the battle of Jericho that we read in the book of Joshua. But, you know, simultaneously, what I'll certainly appreciate in, in the question is that that message of circling Jericho and the you know, circle for seven times, circle for seven days, and the the terua sound, the, the the broken sound that, as we noted last time, is one of the the essential identifying sounds of the shofar is is definitely also a sound that is used in coronation that is as we read in in psalm 96 uh, to make the teruah sound before the king god so you know on some level that that message of coronation is one that we definitely find there and that declaration of God is the Lord is a message of coronation on Yom Kippur. So I, I, I can't say I know of a, an explicit connection, but conceptually, I think that we could certainly say there's a link. I see there's, there's a, a raised hand. Um, MM? Yes. <clears throat> Hello. Um, well, thank you very much. My name is Marta, um, and I would like I would like to thank you. It was fantastic the teaching. Um, I I noticed, and I'm not sure what that means, but from from your forty times three transcendence days that you mentioned, that sums to hundred and twenty. And. Wait, 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 psalm, which psalm? No, no, 120 days, four, four times. Uh, uh, yeah. oh, oh, yes. Three times 40 transcendent days. Yes. That you mentioned that Moshe was uh, with with God. And I um, know from Mark Bilt's, um teachings that 120 jubilees would be 6,000 years. And I, I'm not sure you you just mentioned the coronation um, of the king of kings. So, does that have any significance to to where um, the the 120 transcendent days uh, times 50 times the jubilee is 6,000 years? That, that's a that's a fascinating proposal. Like, first of all, we're talking about days. We're not talking about years. And um, I, I certainly can't make any appeal to an explicit source that would link these two. Simultaneously, yeah, of course, there is that message with respect to the Jubilee, as we noted last time, of the great cosmic homecoming. And uh, yeah, that certainly is a central theme with respect to the Jubilee year. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really so keen on trying to conflate the numbers here, but to that extent, I think there is certainly a, a certain element of commonality. So I hope that's a partial answer. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. God bless you. 
Anybody else going once? <clears throat> Wait, going uh, twice. We just take a look at the chat messages. Are, are there any questions here? Anything? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry? I'm not sure. <clears throat> um, just, in, yeah, sure. I, I'm not. I'm not hearing clearly. So. Yeah, uh, that's all right. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Y'all be blessed. Bye bye. Okay. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Thank you. Uh, uh, Pastor Mark, I see there is a question with respect to the, the last, last week's session. Is it recorded? Is there a recording? Yes, it's supposed to be. I'll find out uh, if they have it up on our website. Okay. Okay, thanks. Bye. Okay. Shalom, shalom. Bye, bye Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm.